Today I'll be reading Zine Librarian's Code of Ethics Zine. There it is. Got it from my public library. It was created by Heidi Berthod, Joshua Barton, Jeremy Brett, Lisa Darms, Violet Fox, Jenna Friedman, Jennifer La Sup Suprema, Hecker, Lillian Karabiak, Rhonda Kaufman, Kelly McElroy, Milo Miller, Honor Moody, Jude Vicon, Madeline Veitch, Selena Williams, and Kelly Wooten, who clip arted the hell out of the scene. Preamble. We, the community of zine librarians and archivists, believe that because zines are often produced by members of marginalized communities, because we strive to respectfully engage with, with and represent those communities, because librarians, archivists are often part of the communities that make read, make slash read zines, because the material itself so beautifully and wonderfully varied is often wide, ephemeral, magical, dangerous, and emotional, because we reject the myth of library archival neutrality. Therefore, we want to be accountable to our users, our institutions, our authors, donors, and communities. That's kind of the picture there. Just to give you an idea. Acquisition and collection development. Number one, not all methods of acquisition are equal. Libraries and archives can acquire zines through donations or purchases. Many institutions have small or non-existent budgets for zine acquisitions and will therefore rely heavily on donation. We believe this to be perfectly acceptable and in keeping with the generous spirit of donors towards cultural institutions. However, we, believe, we also believe that institutions should strive when possible to purchase zines. Because of the nonprofit nature of zines, the creators of zines often lose money or barely break even. Finally, supporting zinesters by purchasing their creations can help sustain their ability to keep making zines. Moreover, purchasing zines demonstrates respect for the value of the zinesters' work. P.S. In addition to a collection development, Policy. Other policies should be in place. Any institution should be able to answer questions about how these materials will be managed during their life on the shelf, as with any form, any other form. Rather, zines will require policies on issues such as how to handle duplicate titles or when weeding is appropriate. So there's the picture for that one, the clip art. All right, so just to give you a little bit of um, an idea of what's going on, I'm gonna be reading, I've got a little smiley faces by the different ways to acquire or distribute zines. It says the, follow, the following method of acquisitions are rated in order of preference. Purchasing directly from author or publisher, so that's a smiley face. Though it can be a bit more work to acquire zines this way, it ensures that all profits go directly to the author or publisher. And there's kind of a neutral face. Purchasing from a zine distributor distro. Zines are, zines are small distributors who buy zine, uh, zine distros are small distributors who buy zines from authors or publishers at a discount, then resell them. Though distros can help streamline the acquisitions process, zine authors and publishers get a small cut of the profits when zines are purchased this way. Receiving donations from the author or publisher, it's kind of like a more of a frowny face. Receiving donations from third parties, it can be difficult to determine where the donor acquired their zines, so this, is, this can be an ethical quandary. Creating unauthorized copies, it's getting more sad and more concerned. While some zinesters see no problem with this, especially for out-of-print materials, many others find it unacceptable and see it as a breach of trust. Purchasing from an unauthorized third party. Now, 
Smiley face is crying. This might include purchasing items from other collectors or sellers online. Some zinesters find it objectionable when others sell their work for profit, while some do not. Collecting institutions should strive to understand the motives and desires of the zinesters when making purchase decisions. Whenever possible, it is important to give creators the right of refusal if they do not wish their work to be highly visible. Because of the often highly personal content of zines, creators may object to have their material be public, publicly accessible. Zinesters, especially those who created zines before the internet, typically create their work without thought to their work ending up in institutions or being read by large numbers of people. To some, exposure to a wider audience is exciting, but others may find it uncomfortable or unwelcome. For example, a scenester who wrote about questioning their sexuality as a young person in a zine distrib uh, distributed to their friends may object to having that material available in patrons in a library. Or a particular zinester as a countercultural creator may object to their scene in a government or academic institution. I think this is really, just as a side note, I think it's a really important point because um, I think a lot of times with the kind of the entrepreneurial mindset, you think, I want to get this out to you know as many people as I possibly can. I want to make my zine like you know, a big magazine or something, but it's not really the point of zines. Um, it's a work of art, and sometimes it's really just for a group of friends. Sometimes it's just easier to make a zine than to write a letter about um, coming out of the closet or a struggle you're having with your family or um, your community. So when purchasing zines directly from authors or publishers or when soliciting donations, for an institution, it is ethical and considerate to note that the materials will be available to the, to the broader public. This is easily achieved with a quick word when acquiring materials in person or with an email or note in the comments section of an online form when purchasing online. This courtesy may not be necessary when purchasing from a distro. If creators have placed their work with one there's typically an expectation that there will be a wider viewing public. Still, this only addresses acquisitions of current materials, as alluded to above in the section on acquiring zines. Third-party donations can be tricky, particularly when the creators may, may be difficult or impossible to track. While it might be admirable, an admirable goal to ask permission of zinesters, to include their work in a library slash archives, or at least inform them that their work in a particular collection <clears throat> is in a particular collection. This may require intensive efforts depending on the size and age of the donation. The librarian archivist will have to gauge the importance of maintaining good relations with zinesters against the time and resources involved in making and retaining contact. <clears throat> it's got some little hearts down there. For libraries and archives that accept third-party donations, it may, it may be most important that all parties involved simply act in good faith. And if there are qualms about a certain donation or about third-party donations in general, it is always an option to not accept the zines into the collection. You should have a thoughtful collection development policy in place. Having a publicly accessible collection development policy specifically for your zines, zine collection is highly recommended. The definition of what constitutes a zine is nebulous, so having parameters spelled out can help prevent unrelated materials from creeping into a collection. For example, political newsletters, literary journals, and brochures when they are unwanted. A collection development policy is a set of rules and guidelines that determine the focus of your zine library collection. 
A written policy allows an institution to seek out certain zines that fall within scope while being able to confidently reject material that doesn't. Because of the unlimited subjects that zines can be about, a collection development policy statement may include specific areas of interest for developing, for example, zines by locals. An effective policy might describe the core collection as well as special interests and exclusions. Zine library, librarians slash archivists should strive to promote a variety of viewpoints in the zines and their collections. The very heart of zines is their ability to give voice to those who are not traditionally represented in libraries slash archives, so it is vital whenever possible to include zines from underrepresented populations. With consideration to zines created by people of different races, ethnicities, genders, classes, ages, abilities, sexual orientations, and so on. It's got the gender symbol there. Part of zines are all the pictures. That's why I'm showing all the pictures. Access to zines in libraries and archives carries an inherent tension. As librarians and archivists, we have a responsibility to respect the professional and ethical traditions of reasonable and equitable access to materials. As cultural advocates who strive to positively and respectfully engage with the creative communities, we, we document we also have a responsibility to consider personal privacy concerns of zine creators because these two responsibilities may come into conflict. Zine librarians and archivists should consider the principles in this section of the code with respect to access to materials in their care. Zine libraries slash archives will inevitably take different approaches, some emphasizing preservation, others leaning more towards access. However, regardless of the librarians slash archivists approach, one should always be willing to consider a zine maker's request for how their work is identified or otherwise treated. Sensitivity to both creator and creation is paramount in zine librarianship. Zine librarians and archivists are therefore sensitive to the environments in which zines are created and distributed. We should consult with zine creators and communities and respect the desires for autonomy and privacy of those creators and communities. We should not expose the legal identities of zine creators in case where those identities are not explicitly noted in the zines themselves, we want zine makers to feel safe having their zines in our libraries. See, unusable materials are useless materials. Zine librarians and archivists should strive towards the highest practical degree of access to the zines in our care within the context of our institutional missions and populations when we interact with zine creators and donors. We should provide a balance between reader and researcher access the zine creators' wants and needs regarding privacy. Zine librarians slash archivists should make every effort to create environments that are physically and emotionally accessible, where whether or not the institution a zine librarian is housed within if there is a larger institution, has a safer space policy, zine libraries should always be sensitive to issues of, among other things, race, class, gender, sexuality, physical disability, and mental slash emotional health. Zine librarians slash archivists' overarching goal is to facilitate recognition of zines as legitimate cultural artifacts, documenting 20th and 21st century lives. To that end, we should do our best to preserve them and make them accessible to future readers and researchers via physical access and description. We should be sensitive to how the need and wants of zine creators can conflict with those of scholars, journalists, and people who read zines for pleasure and do our best to find a balance. Working in concert with our constituents, zine makers, and zine readers.
preservation. The special nature of zines should be considered as a part of preservation. Given the ephemeral nature of zines and I'll start over. Given the ephemeral nature of zines, any zine may be one or a few of a kind item. Proper preservation of materials that meets the needs and requirements of an institution or zine collecting body should be used in order to keep zines in proper condition, whether they are circulating or not. Zine library preservation practices run a full spectrum from little to no active preservation to housing them in acid-free folders and boxes or plastic envelopes. The key is to find what level of preservation fits the use and budget of the collection. It is also important to note that many zine purchases come with extras that libraries or archives may not be accustomed to receiving. These extras may include free zines, pens, stickers, handwritten notes, and elaborately decorated envelopes. It is important to consider if these items will be saved, and if so, to make sure that the staff who deal with receiving are aware that certain pieces will require special handling. For instance, these additional materials may be discarded, shelled, or housed with the zine, or housed separately from the zine in its own collection. <clears throat> Use. Whereas we define access as engaging with zines online or in physical locations such as zine libraries slash archives or at least zine fairs. Use is <clears throat> use in this code refers to reproduction of zines or quoting from zines and other in another source. Reproduction can include copying zines in their original formats and redistributing them, printing uh, portions in books, or any kind of online sharing. From comprehensive archival projects to publishing images in online newspapers, blogs, or in or any form of social media, this section of the code is a guide through questions of zine usage as well as providing best practices and ethics regarding copyright and permissions. Copyright, copyright left, creative commons. Zines have copyright, just like more traditional published materials. The U.S. Copyright Code allows librarians and archivists to make copies for researchers to use for their own research. This assumes, of course, that the materials won't be shared or, again, reproduced in any way. If further reproduction is required, for example, the exhibits, copyright law requires that permission be sought from authors if reproduction is for educational purposes or significantly transforming the original, this may fall under fair use discussed ahead. Zine usage has a particular context or context associated with it. In our experience, reproducing or sharing zines involves <clears throat> not just copyright law, but also zinesters inherent right to decide how their work is attributed and how widely <clears throat> and how it is contextualized. In some, it is about community, about research, and about the simple act of being a considerate person and information professional. Zines are not mass distributed books. They're often self-published and self-distributed. Printed in small very small runs and intended for a small audience. Zinesters may feel differently about having their work openly available on the internet or in print, made available to a much wider audience. Some zinesters also feel that context is important. This can mean the format that it was meant to be in paper and held in the hands, or it can mean that the zine works best when it is read as a whole project, as a whole product rather than having one or a few pages excerpted or reprinted. These are among the considerations of the zine librarian slash archivist should observe when deciding how or whether to reproduce an item for use. So as we're talking about that, I'm reading it on YouTube, so I don't know where that uh, 
the ethics of that choice lies, but um, at the end, I'll try to, as much as I can, I'll try to find a way that you all can read it in its original form. Uh, I guess, oh, okay. It says it's under the Creative Commons, so I think we're all good. <laughs> but I'll still try to give out that info at the end. Seeking permissions for zine usage can be complex, but remains an important step. There are many different uses of zines for which one should seek permission for students and researchers who want to use excerpts or even images in an academic paper that is not going to be published in print or online. Citation is usually enough. If one wants to publish an image from a zine in print or online, recommend obtaining permission from authors. There are some gray areas or casual uses for which zinesters may not usually request advanced permission. For instance, posting a picture from a zine or a zine cover on social media or in a blog, usually with a short credit including the title of the zine and or the author. Copying an entire zine even for personal use is generally not a respectable practice unless the creator specifies permission or produces a zine under an appropriate Creative Commons license. Researchers or journalists writing extensively about a particular zine creator or community should get in touch with the relevant people directly when possible. The zine library archives holding their work is not a proxy for the people who created them, but librarians slash archivists can and should direct researchers towards those creators when they can. Whenever a zine is reproduced or described online in social media, in a library catalog or website and <clears throat> or other venue, if the zine creators contacts the holding institution and request that the content be removed or edited, we recommend respecting their wishes. So if anyone's watching this who made this, want me to take this video down, by all means. It may be possible to argue fair use based on these principles. The purpose of the use, the nature of the work used, the amount of sustainability of the work used, and the effect of the use upon the potential market for or value of the work used. However, in the name of, the, of community respect, we advise getting explicit permission whenever possible. Document all efforts to contact the person or persons. If this is a project with multiple zines that require permission, permission use a spreadsheet to keep track of attempts at contact. That's kind of interesting. This will not provide complete legal protection, but it is important to do dil due diligence in, the, in, the, in this process. If a zine has more than one author, the editor may need to be contacted. <clears throat> if there is one clear person in this role, as well as the creator of the content, locating one of those people will most likely lead to the others. Sometimes if a zine was created collectively, one person may feel authorized to speak for the group. And in other cases, they may wish to each individually give permission for the usage. Suggested process for obtaining permissions. What does asking for permission mean? If a publishing a book or academic article the editor or publisher may provide an official form to get a signature. One's own form can suffice if one is wor working independently. Such a form should include the following information. Name, address, telephone number, and email address, title slash position, and name of affiliated institution, if any. The date of the request, a complete and accurate citation, a precise description, of the proposed use of the copyrighted material as well as when or how long the material will be used. The signature line, the copyright holder, including their title if they are representing a company and, a, and the date. Tracking down the creator of a zine can be difficult, particularly for those published in the 1990s pre-internet email times or under a pseudonym. If contact info is available on the zine itself, 
try using that or searching online for an email address, blog, social media, etc. To make the request, Zine Librarian's email list or other forms may be helpful in tracking down people. And then it says, um, gives a, uh, a URL, it says groups.yahoo.com slash neo slash groups slash zine librarian slash info. There's the pictures. Organization. This section aims to help librarians and archivists think through some of the implications of making zines accessible via core library slash archival functions of cataloging, organizing, or describing. The zine environment requires careful thought before embarking on these functions. To echo our preamble, zines are often wide, ephemeral, magical, dangerous, and emotional. Dangerous to whom, one might ask. It likely depends on whom one asks, but in the age of the internet, at least one prospectively endangered population are zinesters themselves. Librarians and archivists should consider that making zines discoverable on the web or in local catalogs and databases could have impacts on the creator <clears throat> or creators. Anything from mild embarrassment to divulging of dangerous personal information. Zine librarians slash archivists should strive to make zines as discoverable as possible while also respecting the safety and privacy of their creators. There are several aspects of organizational descriptive work to consider when processing zines. Levels of description. <clears throat> the more detailed descriptions provided for with zines, the more discoverable they will be. Within the specific con conventions of collecting institution, zines should be described as fully as possible. But with sensitivity to the amount of private information or living persons that might also be revealed. Identifying zinesters. In general use, <clears throat> in general use the form of name on the piece being cataloged. If recon, uh, reconciling, if reconciling forms of names to an authority file, use care to identify sensitive cases where the author may not want their full name associated with the zine. Be prepared to receive and respond to requests to change or remove name information in catalog records for zines. We encourage but do not mandate deference to zine creators' wishes in this regard. Authority data for zinesters. When creating authority records for zinesters, refrain from recording more personal information than is necessary or required to identify the person under the rules or conventions of the authority file. Subject analysis is a fine art in zine librarianship slash archiving. As a zine, as zine librarians and archivists, we make every effort to broaden access and use through the most relevant and specific subject headings, summaries, and other notes. This process is not infallible, and sometimes errors will happen, such as the use of headings that offend or do not resonate with scene creators. It is important that ways, can, uh, that ways be found in the process to invite feedback and create avenues for both authors and users to request revisions to a record. With subject analysis, note that subject terms can be controlled or uncontrolled. Controlled terms have the benefit of linking a user to larger swaths of related resources. They come from collecting from controlled <laughs> they come from controlled vocabularies or subject theor uh, theosauri, like Library of Congress subject headings, Library of Congress genre. Form th thesaurus, art and architecture thesaurus, anchor archive thesaurus. In assigning subject headings to zines, we recognize that there will be imperfect fits and that catalogers must balance col collocation and discoverability of materials with using the language and terminology of zine authors. 
Subject access can be enhanced with uncontrolled terms and keyword rich summary notes. Beyond subject discoverability, note that when no thesauri have the right terms to address a particular issue or community represented in a zine, uncontrolled terms will at least make a record more keyword searchable. Uncontrolled terms might be terms used on the fly by the cataloger or terms pulled from the resource itself. Getting more significant keywords or phrases in a summary note will also achieve this and give users a better sense of the zine to boot. Additional considerations for zine subject analysis. If the, zine, if the zines reside within a larger collection, using some headings from the standard thesaurus adopted by your library or collection, Library of Congress, subject headings, Sears, will make them more discoverable when zines turn up alongside books, movies, and other kinds of information in a catalog search. Users will have greater access to alternative perspectives when using a thesaurus. Adhering to its documented rules for use creates better collation <coughs> Co-location. So try to use it correctly. Supplement more formal or establish the ORSI, uh, the SORI, bed, with others that provide more accurate language or greater granularity. Some examples of the SORI to look at include the zine-specific anchor archive, the thesaurus, or the visual art focused art and architectural art, art and architecture thesaurus local headings that co-locate common genres of zines can be very helpful for users looking to browse a catalog more thorough discussions of subject analysis for zines can be found in the 2013 article friedman jenna and Rhonda kaufman 2013 cutter and paste a DIY guide for catalogers who do not know about zines and zine librarians who do not know about cataloging, an informed agitation library and information skills in social justice movements and beyond, edited by Melissa Monroe, Library Juice Press. And there's a website, but it's covered up by a library label, so I can't really read it. Um... Yeah, well, that was kind of neat. Um, sorry, I fumbled a few times there, but um, yeah, it's kind of fun to read a zine on here. I'm somewhat getting back into zines um, after a long time. All right, well, I think I've shown you all the pictures. There's a cat at the, the end. So, yep, thanks.